I'm bringing my pulpit up. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to welcome all of you, especially the brave ones that came this morning. Well done on coming. Um, there are a lot of people still snuggling in bed. Um, and, um, and so, I want to commend you for being the brave ones. Well done. Good job. And I won't fall into that whole melting thing that trap that Cindy and I fell into last time. Um, where I suggested that, that people don't melt, and then Cindy said she would, she did, and then I said us, anyway. Yeah, people, people just didn't seem to understand me. Anyway, bottom line is, is we want to, I want to welcome you here, and um, I'm so glad that you're in church, and um, the, Lord is, the Lord is doing big things in our, our, in our church. Two weeks ago, we had our biggest ever Connect group attendance at uh, at 717 people on anatomy. So big things are happening and um, we're going forward. So today I want to talk to you, my topic is rebuild your life, rebuild your city. And um, I want to talk to you about, have you guys ever really, trying to think of the right word, um, have you, ever, have you guys ever really nailed down exactly why Jesus came to earth? In other words, if I, if, if I woke you up at, at midnight or two in the morning, um, there's that, that comedian that does, wakes up people and does a quiz at two in the morning. Um, it's actually quite funny, but anyway, I won't do that, don't worry. I'm not arriving to say, why did Jesus come at two in the morning? Um, but anyway... Um, I, I, I think that we need to understand that. And so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and explain to you what, what was happening and then how that affects us and how it affects our lives. And so I want you to keep listening online, keep, keep tuned in, and of course, please share into your um, WhatsApp status. So many people click on and the more we can get the word of the Lord out, the better. So, in the beginning, in Genesis 6, verses um, 31, it says, At the end of creation, then God looked over all that he had made, and it was excellent in every way. This ended the sixth day. So, what was creation? Creation was excellent in every way. And of course, of course, we know about the story of the fall, where Adam and Eve fell. They got, they got conned by um, the poser, the serpent. And so by, by um, the time Solomon comes along, he writes a book called Ecclesiastes. And, he's, and the character that he uses is someone called the preacher, And the preacher says in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 14 to 15, I observed everything going on under the sun, and really it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. This is very important. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. So we go from a creation that's that's excellent in every way, to Solomon, the wisest man on the earth, observing what is wrong cannot be made right, what is missing cannot be covered, recovered. That's pretty hectic, actually. And, and a lot of people, if you look around, a lot of people would agree with the preacher. The preacher, because if we look around, there seems to be so much wrong. And there's so much missing. And so, what, was the, what caused this? In Romans um, six, ver- 3 verse 23, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall, sh- fall short of God's glorious standards. So we look around, and there's so much wrong with the world. 
I, was, I, I took a sample of the headlines from the last few months, and um, we see, of course, the Ukrainian war, um, the, where the Russians have been w retreating. They found many, many civilians just shot to death with their hands tied behind their back. We, 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 we of course, have the, the water situation. Praise the Lord, there's rain today. I trust it's in the, in the dams. But, I mean, uh, Matthew has had weeks this year without water. Um, we've had the riots here in South Africa. Of course, we've had coronavirus, the COVID pandemic, and we see so many divorces and, and so much brokenness. And then this week, there was an article published in the Daily Maverick. Fourteen babies and toddlers have starved to death in Nelson Mandela Bay in the past 15 months. If that doesn't make you feel like, think, like what's, that the world is crooked and broken, then I don't think anything will. It's, it's, it's absolutely tragic that people within 30 kilometers of us could, Little babies could starve to death. We live in a broken, broken world. And so, what did Jesus come to do? He came, it says, in, uh, it says but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus came to come and restore this broken world. He came to try and put it back together again. And of course, we know that it'll only be finally put together when he returns one day. But he came here to reverse the effects. He came to reverse the effects of what had happened, this broken, broken world. And so the first thing that he did when he arrived, so, so what happened was, is that he was born, he lived for 30 years, and then at the age of 30, and it's probably because it was from the age of 30 that you could be recognized as a rabbi or teacher, he starts to teach. And the first place he goes to is his hometown. And he, and he opens the scroll, and it's quoted in Luke um, 4, verses 18 to 19. And it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and this is what the, G, Jesus is quoting from a passage in Isaiah 61. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He's, he's, <laughs> for those of you online, uh, someone was calling. Um, I don't think it was... I, I don't think it was Lionel Richie. Hello, is it me you're looking for? Not, okay. Lionel didn't call. So let's get back to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So what does Jesus do? He gets up and he says, this is what I'm here to do. This is why I've come. I've come to preach good news to the poor. And, and, and let's just read the rest of our, the, the next two verses in Isaiah 61. This is verses 2 and 3, which is a continuation of what he quoted. And it says, he sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, and to be honest, there are lots of people who are mourning here in South Africa because of COVID and the pandemic. And there are lots of people who've died of other things as well in the last year or two. You give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. So he came, what he came to do is for those who wanted 
for those who wanted to accept his rulership that he would restore what had been broken and what had been lost. That's why Jesus came, because that he had created this world that was excellent in every way. But it's broken now. And his goal was to try and restore it one by one in the lives of the people who would accept his authority. And it's incredible what he promises to do. He promised to... Um, in fact, let's, let's quickly... The, the, what he promised to do. He promised to, he, he promised to bring good news to the poor, freedom from captivity, the blind will see, which is healing and revelation, um, the oppressed, there's an O missing, the oppressed will be set free and they would receive God's favor. Isn't this an incredible promise for us it's an incredible promise. So let's have a look and see what, how, he's, he's follow, how the people that he read this out to responded. And it says, when they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Because he had said, because he then goes on to say it was only a, a Syrian and some other foreigner who had received God before. And they became, they became incensed. The people in the synagogue were furious. Now, these are the people that he had grown up with. These were the people in, a, in, an, in, the, in one of the other Gospels. They, say, they all say, isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter, the artisan? What's he saying rubbish like this for, basically? And jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. So they tried to kill him because he was promising change. I'm going to, if someone got up here and said, I want to, I want to help the oppressed. I want to set the prisoner free. I want to... I want to bring hope to the poor. What, what would you do? But unfortunately, because we live in a broken world, they, what they, they thought is, how dare this guy that we've grown up promise to change anything, and so they tried to kill him. Fortunately, it wasn't his time, and so he was able to get away. I believe the Holy Spirit blinded or just, I'm not entirely sure if it stopped the crowd completely. But the people he grew up with tried to kill him because he, he, he promised to come and try and fix this broken world. And that's how broken it is. When people want to do what is right, so often there's opposition. I know one of the things we've been trying to do is We've got a church in the Bethelstorp area. It's Extension 21, I think. And we tried to clean up around the church, and people came and threatened the people to, who were cleaning up. We planted trees, and they came and they stomped on the trees. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where where brokenness has become our default, and if you want to try and do something different, people, if you want to fix it in any way, people become angry with you. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that Jesus came to fix this world. And what, and, and what these scriptures are called in Isaiah 61, verse 1, 2, and 3, and of course, in Luke, where, Jesus, where it's recorded that Jesus read from them, we call it the Messiah's mandate. This is what he came to do. You know, when, you, when a new product is released, there's a grand opening, and they, you know, they, they do video and pyrotechnics and, and um, presentations, and there's music and all of that and lights. Of course, they had none of that, so what did Jesus do? He comes and he reads a scroll. 
actually got far more of a reaction than many of these launches do. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that this is the Messiah's mandate. And to be honest, if, and, and to be clear with you, I think that the church does quite well with the Messiah's mandate. Because you must remember that, that those who tried to throw Jesus off the cliff were not going to be repaired by him. Why? Because they rejected him. So the only people that can be fixed by Jesus are the ones who want to be fixed by Jesus. If you, st- if you want to stay the way you are, if you don't want to change, then you don't have to. You can remain broken. But there are lots and lots of people who come through our doors who want to change. Maybe not at first, but they listen to the message and the Holy Spirit gets in their hearts and things start to change. And so in Romans, um, Romans um, 8 verse 23, sorry, 6 verse 23 it says, For now we are free from the power of sin and have become, and have become slaves of God. Now we do these things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, the brokenness, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we preach this from our pulpits and we've, got, and we've, we've seen the effect of this on people's lives. I've been involved in this church for 45 years. Yeah, I know all of you going, no. Don't be rude. Um, Anyway, and I've seen so many people's lives irrevocably changed and transformed. I think we do an incredible job. I think the church does a really good job. There are lots of people that I talk to here who were addicted to some sort of substance. There are people here uh, in, in our church, whose, whose marriages were broken. We once asked how many people had been healed in word of faith. Their bodies had been healed. And in one service, there were o- over 80% of people had received a miraculous healing. The people whose finances were down the toilet and, they, and, they, and, and God has restored them. And they lo- And I'm not just speaking of word of faith. I know of great church after great church after great church who who has fulfilled the Messiah's mandate. And we work very hard at the Messiah's mandate. We, here at Word of Faith, we've got our our life point journey. We we start you off with starting point. Why? Because that's where you begin. Then, then we have the Turning Point woman, uh, Men and Women's Weekend um, this, this week. Um, starting on Thursday, we have a Women's Turning Point, and we have seen so many lives transformed and turned around. The people, the, 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 the people that have, have, have seen their lives full of brokenness that are completely transformed. We've been seen fathers reconciled to sons. We've seen marriages repair. We've seen, I mean, testimony after testimony. One, one guy grew up, his father had such a problem with anger that twice the next door neighbors had to come and pull, pull um, his mother out of a hole. That, he, that his dad was trying to bury her alive in. The, the brokenness in that person's life, the brokenness that he let go. We've seen people go straight home from turning point and reconcile with their families. We've seen, we, we, we've seen addictions broken. There's so many people who've had their lives changed. We, we, we have leadership training with PowerPoint and, of course, growth point. You get baptized. And then we, you go through growth point and we, and we, we, give, we establish you in the, in the word 
This is all part of the Messiah's mandate that we have to do. But I don't think that churches always, and I speak of our own, but in churches in general, you see, because I've read you Isaiah 61 verse 1, 2, and 3. But too often, very often, the church has stopped and not read verse 4. You see, if your church, if all you do is come to church is to get yourself restored, then the fullness of the Messiah's mandate is never achieved. Because what does verse 4 say? Now remember, it was speaking about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to restore people, to set captives free, to, uh, to help the poor and all of that. Who is they in the scripture? You see, let, let me read it. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing the cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they've been deserted for many generations. Who's the they? I see James lifting his hands. It's him. If Jesus has set you free, if Jesus has, has, has healed you, if Jesus has transformed your life, if Jesus has made you new, then it's you. The, say, the they is me. The they is me. Online, type, they is me. I will rebuild the ancient ruins, repair, repairing cities long ago. I will revive them though they've been deserted for many generations. You see, if all we ever do, and, and, and I've realized this, too many churches just preach verses one, two, three, and they don't preach verse four. They restore you, they rebuild you, and should they continue to do so? Yes, yes, yes. If we, don't, if we don't see people's life transformed, we're not fulfilling the, the Messiah's mandate. But if those people do not start to rebuild their city, then they're never going to be free. You see, one of the big mistakes that we make is we focus on ourselves and we try and fix ourselves. But if we do not start to rebuild the city and care about other people and help other people and start to bring the freedom that Jesus gives, then we're always going to be the oppressed and the poor. We're never, ever going to grow into full maturity. Until you start helping someone else, you're always going to be a victim. Until you start caring for other people, you're always going to be a victim. It's when you go to verse 4 that you start to fully mature. And so, what do we do here at Word of Faith? And, and, and before we actually get to that, let me talk, read you from 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 to 3. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I, I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to the world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger and you still aren't ready. You see, if we are forever in a restoration cycle in our lives, that's not God's plan. God wants to take you from where you are and he wants to move you into rebuilding the city. And if you don't leave that, you're always gonna be on milk. You're never gonna be on solid food. You're always gonna be an infant in Christ. And a, there's nothing cuter than a little baby Actually, I, in my humble opinion, the, the two to five-year-old age group's the cutest, but, but there's nothing cuter than a small child, but a 30-year-old in nappies. <laughs> drinking a bottle, going, 
It's, it's disgusting. And so that's what God is calling you to do, is He's calling you, if you have given your life to Jesus, if He's started to restore you, He's asking you to go to verse 4. He's asking you to start to rebuild the city. If you've just got saved or you've never got given your heart to the Lord or you've been out of church for a long time, then the Messiah is here to restore you. The Messiah is here to rebuild you. The Messiah is here to set you free. If your finances are in trouble, he's here to help you miraculously. If you're, if, if you're, if you're sick, he's healed, here to heal you. If you're bitter and angry, he's here to set you free. If you're, if, if you're blind, he's here to open your, your eyes. But once he's done that, you have to go to verse 4. You have to become a city rebuilder. Otherwise, you're never, ever, ever going to grow in the Lord. You're going to be that horrible 30-year-old baby. And so, what do we at Word of Faith try and do? Well, how do we try and rebuild our city? We, we're looking to establish 400 connect groups, partly because we want to care for more people, because there's so many people that are going to hell. We have to win more of our city for Jesus. But also, we believe that as we establish spiritual authority in different streets, so our, the, the spiritual atmosphere in our city is going to change, and that'll help us to rebuild our city. As you can see, we're, we're more and more starting to cover our city. Our goal is to totally saturate our city with connect groups. What happens in the connect group? We teach the word. We talk to each other about the word. If you want to read the Bible, it's best to be read aloud and discussed. And we do that in connect group. We pray for each other. And then, and then those groups start to do stuff. Pray for the city. They start to care for people. And so that's, uh, that's one of the ways we look to rebuild our city. Project Hope. We've been at this for 20 years trying to rebuild the city. My own wife cooks for Project Hope every, on, uh, on Sundays. Trying, we, we, we feed people. We do, we do homework clubs with them in the deeply impoverished. The, the, that article about the, the 14 kids, that, that, have, that um, the 14 kids, that, that um, starved to death. In that area, we are one of the few organizations that are feeding. Why? Because we care about our city. And it's not just us, it's our ordinary members that get involved and help us to feed our city, feed the, the hungry. Why? Because we are city rebuilders. Jesus set us free so that we could rebuild our city. Um, because of, because of, of um, the, this, the mention of what happened in our city, KFC have come on board with us with their uh, hope something. Pardon? Add hope. Add hope. And they're going to be giving us more food so that we can feed people. There's a French television station that's coming this week to interview Madge about the situation in, of hunger in, in our city. More and more, the Lord has been opening doors. Why? Because we don't want a single person in our city to go hungry. Why? Because we're city rebuilders. The Messiah came to make us city rebuilders. We get you to adopt your street and pray for your street. That's part of rebuilding our city. We encourage you to do so. We've got the Easter weekend where we're encouraging you to put names in here, pray for them and invite them to church. We want more people to, to have their lives restored. We've got Heart for the House where people get involved as ushers and children's church workers and in, involved in our admin. Why? Because if we 
if we don't get you to verse 4, if we don't get you to be a city rebuilder, you will never be free. You'll never be free. We pray for our city. Two weeks ago, I was feeling quite despondent about our city management. And there was the, the city, the, the, the speaker of our council on, I think it was the Thursday, he, he had changed the vote. The vote was 59-58, and he added an extra vote to make it 59-59 to get what they wanted, which is real corruption. And that Sunday night, we prayed for our city. The next morning, his party withdrew him as, speak, as, as, as a counselor in our city. The next day, he was brought we, why? Because we prayed. Is our, city, is our council sorted out? Is our city sorted out? No, not yet. We need to keep praying. But that something that we specifically prayed for the ni- on the Sunday night happened the next day. It was the 20th of March. On the 21st of March, he was withdrawn by his party. 22nd of March, he was, uh, he was declared no longer a councillor. So what are we doing? You see, in, in Ephesians um, 5, verse 25 to 27, it says, Just as Christ loved the church, he gave his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present to her, to himself, as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish, Instead, he will be holy and without fault. What, is, what did Jesus come to do? He came to, to bring a bride, to, to fetch a bride that's without spot or wrinkle, that's perfect. That loves the, the city, that loves the people around them. Has been set free been delivered and has started to care about their environments around them and started to see city transformation. Am I saying this is the only way we can rebuild the city? No, there are lots of people in our church doing different things to rebuild our city. But if you never make it past verse 3, you're always going to be a victim. Whatever hurt, and all of us, every single one of us have had misfortune in our lives. Why? Because we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. But whatever's been done to you, whatever circumstances you've had, whatever circumstances you've grown up in, if you do not start to rebuild the city, your misfortune will define you. I will, this was done to me. That was done to me. Your misfortune will define you. And Jesus came to set you free from that. So I want to, I want to appeal to those here who, and online for whom Jesus, you didn't know that you could be set free. You didn't know that, you, that, that whatever misfortune has held you captive, could, you could be freed of. You didn't know that, that in addiction or that anger or that unforgiveness or that financial situation that you're in, that Jesus would, wanted to come and help you and set you free and change your life. You didn't know that. And so today I want to give you an opportunity I want to give you an opportunity to grab hold of that freedom. So, Because while I talk to you about getting to verse 4, if you don't allow Jesus to set you free, in the verses 1, 2, and 3, you're never going to get to verse 4. You may want to rebuild the city, but if you're in captivity, you're never going to change. So I want to pray for those We want to see their lives changed. 
They want to be transformed. I, want to, I, I ask every, everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. Online, we are posting a, 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 um, a link right now in the comments. Click on that, put your name and number in, and we will contact you. The, the link is going up right now. Click on that, and, and we will contact you. We will pray with you. We will help you. Put your details in. If you are here in the congregation and, and Jesus has been speaking to you, and you've been thinking, I am defined by my misfortune. Jesus has never set, be, set me free. I want to be free. I want to pray for you. And to do that, you need to give me an indication. And so anyone here that Jesus is speaking to, please raise your hand up right now. Say, I want to be included in that prayer. I need Jesus to set me free. I see that hand. Anyone else, quickly, raise your hand. Jesus is here to set you free. Jesus is here to set you free. I want to thank you for raising your hand. Thank you. want everyone to stand. Thank you, Lord. And Elise, there's a lady on the aisle that prays to hand. Could you stand with her and go and pray with her just up there? Um, I, we want to pray with you specifically. If you could just, on your right, Elise. There we go. Okay. I want to pray for all of you. Jesus is here to set you free. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your kindness and goodness. I want to thank you for your love. I thank you, Jesus, that you came to, to, to fix that, that which couldn't be fixed, to make straight that which couldn't be made straight. You came to fix the brokenness in our lives. And I ask you to heal the brokenness in our lives. I ask you to touch us by your mighty power. I pray, Lord, that you will transform us. But then, Lord, help us to move forward, to start to be a rebuilder of our city. Give us a vision to open a connect group. Give us a vision to get involved in Project Hope. Give us a, a vision to get involved in our church. We thank you for your goodness and kindness. We bless you. Thank you that you've come to make us straight to transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you online if you, if the, if the Lord has touched you, click on that link and let us, and, and, and we will contact you. We want to help you. Then secondly, we're going to be posting a link right now for the Women's Turning Point. That starts this Thursday at uh, seven, 7 o'clock. This Thursday. And if you, have not, if you are not truly free, if there are things that, that still define you, things that, this happened to me, that happened to me, the next thing happened to me, then I want to ask you to click on, click on that, the Women's Turning Point link and register and come and join us. Come and see your life transformed. Come and see your city, come and see your life change so that you can be a city changer. I want to remind you, we're going to pray now, because remember, we always pray for our streets in our service, because we are city rebuilders. I want, I want you to um, be online tonight at 7 Prophet Denver Marks is going to be online his incredible blessing and his anointed man of God and he's going to touch you. So don't forget to be online. Let's turn to our streets and pray for our streets. We're going to pray for William Moffat and Lily Avenue. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, that your anointing and power rest upon these streets. I pray, Father God, for these streets and the people that live and work on these streets. Let your glory come upon these streets. Father, let we invite you into our streets, invite you into our city. Let your glory come. Let your, your, the presence of God come, Father, in a mighty, wonderful way. I ask you for power.
power, Lord Jesus, power to touch our city. Thank you, Father, that as we pray, as we work, you will rebuild, that the city will be rebuilt. You've given us the anointing and power to do so. In Jesus' name, we bless this congregation. Let their lives be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming online. Bless you guys. See you next week. And of course, at seven o'clock tonight. Amen.